Hello doctors, this is Dr. Hira Salman. So let's continue with our fifth session today of cardiology, starting from valvular heart diseases. All right. So first of all, definition. All valvular heart disease can be congenital in nature, means by birth you are going to see, and rheumatic fever can lead to any form of valve disease, but mitral stenosis is most common. See, MS, MS is most common, but it's not like that in always rheumatic fever you are going to see MS, but rheumatic fever can lead to any form of valve disease but MS is most common and most of the valvular heart diseases they are congenital in nature by birth you are going to see this defect and aging can automatically be associated with aortic stenosis with the advancing age sclerosis may be there within this aorta and thereby you are going to see aortic stenosis regurgitant disease is most commonly caused by hypertension regurgitant means regurgitation means backward flow of blood so backward flow of blood you are going to see most commonly caused by hypertension so this is this is one of the main important cause and ischemic heart diseases so whenever someone is having ischemic heart disease or he is hypertensive most of the time you are going to see which type of valvular heart disease in that patient regurgitant type of disease now infarction automatically leads to regurgitation starting from ischemia not starting from infarction you are going to start from the ischemia if it's reversible one well and good if it's irreversible one it can automatically convert it into infarction and infarction automatically leads Leads to regurgitation and regurgitation which automatically leads to dilatation so they all are interconnected starting from ischemia then infarction regurgitation and dilated cardiomyopathy all forms of valvular heart disease are associated with shortness of breath so these are the main symptoms how your patient is going to present always with this shortness of breath and many of the sign and symptoms of congestive heart failure but you will always find this shortness of breath only the murmurs are specific in terms of presentation lesion on the right so every murmur is a specific for each and every heart valvular heart disease so only the murmurs are specific in terms of presentation lesions on the right side of the heart right side we have in between the right atrium and the right ventricle we have tricuspid valve in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk we have pulmonic valve right so right side the right side of the heart means tricuspid valve we are talking about and we are talking about pulmonic valve increase in intensity or loudness with inhalation so this is one of the foremost point to remember okay. that once we are inhale once we are doing inhalation what will happen if someone is having you know if someone is having pathology in the right side of the heart maybe something related to tricuspid valve or maybe some disease related to pulmonary valve then what will happen when we inhale the murmur which is produced because of tricuspid regurgitation or stenosis or because of pulmonary regurgitation stenosis its intensity will be increased on inhalation so there is an association with inhalation of the right side of murmurs whether it's a tricuspid one any regurgitation or stenosis or it's a pulmonary one whenever the patients inhale you are going to see the murmur will be increased in intensity during inhalation if it's a right side murmur inhalation will increase now why why it's like that why during inhalation the murmur of the right side is increased so answer is inhalation will increase venous return to the right side of the heart that is very simple right when we are actually talking about the pathophysiology of venous return we know very well that the uh, during inhalation what in, what is happening during inhalation there is the main inspiratory muscle that is going to be contracted and that's diaphragm diaphragm is the main inspiratory muscle one once it start contracted that is known as inhalation during inhalation diaphragm contracts and as a result venous return increase so venous return if there is venous return so venous return is where well. it's towards the right side of the heart so if some pathology is there in the right side of the heart maybe in, in tricuspid maybe in pulmonary definitely you're going to see that during inhalation during the venous return the blood will you know because of the turbulency of the blood because of the pressure of the blood you're going to heard a loud murmur so just remember this pathophysiology that what during venous return during inhalation actually venous return is there because of the contraction of the diaphragm muscle and that's where you're going to heard a loud murmur if it's on the right side 
pathology is on the right side. Now what happens on the left side? Left sided lesions, we know very well in between the left atria and the left ventricle we have mitral valve. In between the left ventricle and the aorta we have aortic valve. So if there is lesion towards the left side like in mitral uh, valve or in aortic valve, now that lesion, that murmur you are going to see that that is going to be increased with exhalation. Exhalation means what? Exhalation is most of the time it's just simple the elastic recoil of the lung. Inspiration is actually because of the contraction of the diaphragm but exhalation is purely the elastic recoil of the lung. So during exhalation, exhalation will squeeze blood out of the lungs. So as a result, when a squeezing of blood taking place outside of the lung and into the left side of the heart, because we know very well pulmonary veins, they are coming from the lungs and they are opening into the left side of the atrium, right? So pulmonary veins, they are carrying the oxygenated blood and they are coming from the lungs. So if there is a squeezing of blood out of the lungs, the pulmonary veins will be having a high pressure and that high pressure when they are going to deliver towards the left side of the heart. That that's why you are saying that during expiration, when squeezing of the blood is taking place outside the lungs and because of pulmonary veins, they're getting that pressure and they're coming towards the left side of the heart to automatically they're going to deliver that pressure towards the left side of the heart. And that's why during expiration, you're going to hurt the left side of the murmur will be increased. So left side of the murmur will be increased during expiration and you know the pathophysiology pathophysiology is very simple that during expiration because of the squeezing of the lung the the blood pressure is actually increasing in the pulmonary vein and that whole pressure will be affected the left side of the heart and that's why if there is any pathology towards the left side you are going to hear a loud murmur because of that during expiration and what was happening in the right side the right side during inspiration because of the contraction of the diaphragm venous return and is increased and because of the increased venous return the pressure towards because venous return is why so they will be under pressure and they are delivering pressure to the right side of the heart and because of that during inspiration the right side murmur will be increased so two points to be remembered right first thing right side of right side lesion murmur will be increased during inhalation and left side lesion of the heart murmur will be increased during expiration now, if it's clear to you, then diagnostic test. The best initial test for all valvular heart diseases. It's not like we are very particular about stenosis or regurgitation of any particular valve. No, for the whole valvular heart diseases, you should remember that echocardiogram is the best initial test. See, the best initial. If they are not saying initial. Initial is always be the ECG, right? Without doing ECG, how can you proceed towards echocardiography? So automatically, you have to have ECG on your hand. But ECG is just an initial test but when we are considering the best initial test for valvular heart disease we should keep this echocardiogram in our mind this echocardiography is actually the best initial test now we have two types of echocardiography one way is trans esophageal echocardiography and other one is trans thoracic so always remember that trans esophageal is far more better sensitive and more specific as compared to trans thoracic but in routine practices what we usually do we usually do this trans thoracic so in routine practices we are actually performing trans thoracic echocardiography but if someone asks you which one is more better as compared to trans esophageal and trans thoracic you should remember that trans esophageal because of having more accuracy and more sensitivity and more specificity trans esophageal is more accurate as compared to trans thoracic but in routine practices we usually perform trans thoracic echocardiography now what is the most accurate test most accurate test we have catheterization catheterization is the most accurate test and catheterization allows the most precise measurement of valvular diameter of course what we are actually doing during catheterization what is the main purpose of doing catheterization the main purpose of doing catheterization is the most precise measurement of valvular diameter actually you are measuring the diameters of valve as well as the exact pressure gradient across the valve the one who is having high pressure 
pressure low pressure that you are actually recording you are actually recording the diameters of the well so this is considered to be the most accurate test always remember initial one is ecg best initial echocardiography and most accurate is catheterization this is for the whole valvular heart disease they are not talking about they are not saying that only one or any specific one no for the whole valvular heart diseases you are going through with the same thing now there is nothing specific about EKG in those with valvular heart disease but definitely you have to do but the EKG is expected to show hypertrophy of chambers if there is hypertrophy that you will have a clear idea about an EKG when you do EKG you will you will rule out yeah hypertrophy is there but you cannot confirm a diagnosis of valvular heart disease from an EKG alone you have to do echocardiography so that is that is why the best initial one it will be echocardiogram now chest x-ray chest x-ray will allow show will also show hypertrophy and enlargement of various cardiac chambers if you want to see the enlargement that you can do with the help of chest x-ray you can have a look but the precise anatomic correlation with the chest x-ray is poor x-ray evaluation of cardiac chamber size is neither the most accurate test nor the best initial you can do as a supportive test but it, it won't be considered as the most accurate it won't be considered as the best initial best initial will always be echocardiography and most accurate will always be cardiac catheterization now what about the treatment now we are discussing only the general valvular heart disease we are not very specific about any one overall overall valvular heart disease we are discussing so treatment for overall since all forms of valvular heart disease are associated with fluid overload most of the time you are going to see the main pathophysiology is all because of fluid overload in the lungs all of them will benefit from diuretics of course when there is fluid overload the main thing is to get rid of that fluid so by giving diuretics that you can also do so diuretics with the help of benefit you know the main benefit of diuretic that is actually you know help you in getting rid of excess amount of water and that that's why the fluid overload can be reduced so medicine alone can do little to improve stenotic lesions of the mitral aortic valve so medicine at some point of time medicine can work but at times arise that you need to do some surgical intervention so they are saying that medicine alone can do little to improve stenotic lesions of the mitral and aortic valve nearly all patients with symptoms if the patient is having symptom will need correction of the anatomy of the heart and how you're going to do correction of course with the help of surgical intervention mitral stenosis is dilated with the balloon that you can do balloon valvuloplasty and aortic stenosis needs surgical removal or replacement by catheter you really need to replace it with the help of this catheter and you you, you can do with the help of the surgical removal and mitral stenosis if it's there you can you know dilate it with the help of balloon so these are actually a part of you know apart from medicine right so medicine alone can do little to improve in the case of stenosis mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis most of the time in aortic stenosis we usually prefer surgical intervention but in mitral stenosis first you can go with balloon valvuloplasty as well now if you are considering about the regurgitant region now we are only uh, you know talking about the stenotic lesions now what about the regurgitant lesion if there is a regurgitant lesion if there is a backward flow of blood that lesion seems to respond best to vasodilator therapy so this is a common observation if the patient is having any regurgitant disorder like pulmonary regurgitation tricuspid regurgitation aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation in all of these four conditions in all of these four regurgitation you should better use vasodilator dilator therapy with with acis angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocker always remember when there is systolic dysfunction when there is ejection fraction which is below 40 percent it is our main duty to start acis in all arb you are not going to use both of them together only you are going to use one either acis or arbs or especially when the patient is having cough or you know the thing where you can't use acis then as an alternative you can use arbs nifedipine calcium channel blocker or hydrolyzine so these are the things these are the you know major treatment protocol especially you are going to prescribe in the case of regurgitant lesion because they regurgitant lesion they are best respond uh, to the towards this vasodilator therapy and vasodilator therapy we are actually providing with these three things acis arbs nifedipine plus 
or hydrolysine. Now, surgical replacement of regurgitant agent must be done before the heart dilates too much. You are not going to let high heart dilates too much. Before let him, before too much dilatation, we need to offer surgical replacement because if it's too much dilated, the myocardium will never come back to its original position. If the heart dilates excessively, then valve replacement will not be able to correct the disease in systolic function. That's very important. So we should not let this heart dilate too much. Before letting it dilate it too much, you have to, you know, do the surgical replacement. Now, then valve well replacement will not be able to correct the disease in systolic function. If the myocardium stretches too much, it will not return to normal size and shape. That is why we are not allowing heart to dilate too much. Before then, before that, you have to take any intervention like surgical intervention. Assessment of ventricular size is based on the end systolic diameter <coughs> and the ejection fraction. These are the two important tools by which you are going to actually assess the ventricular size. Ventricular size assessment is based, based on two things. First thing is end systolic diameter. At the end of the contraction, what is the diameter of the, uh, you know, uh, ventricle that will help you and ejection fraction. How much amount of blood is ejected in each systole that is known as ejection fraction. So ejection fraction, what is the, what is the percentage of ejection fraction and what is the diameter of end systolic diameter. These two things will give you a clear clue about the assessment of ventricular size. So when the end systolic diameter expand, expand, you are seeing that diameter is expanding. Now this is the high point. This is the high time when you should replace the valve right so you need to monitor end systolic diameter on regular basis because on the on the measurement on the regular basis if you are measuring this end systolic diameter that will give you a clue at this particular time period or at that particular moment you have to replace your valve now endocarditis prophylaxis is not indicated for any of these valve disorder this is very important to whom you know we are actually providing this endocarditis prophylaxis so this is not indicated for any of these valve disorder unless the valve has actually been replaced or there has been previous endocarditis so this is very important whenever the patient is having history of previous endocarditis only in those patients and those uh, actually who are having valve disorders so valve disorder unless the valve has actually been replaced so if there is a valve replacement history in your patient if your patient is having previous history of endocarditis so these two things are actually most important thing to be noted because in these patients we actually provide endocarditis is prophylaxis which patient number one those who are having you know previous infection of endocarditis history of previous infection of endocarditis and number two that is they have mitral already you know replacement of valve is there so valve replacement is already in the in the patient history of valve replacement plus previous history of endocarditis definitely you are going to give endocarditis prophylaxis to your patient now one by one we are going through each valvular heart disease so first of all starting with this mitral stenosis mitral stenosis so by definition is most often caused by rheumatic fever it's not like that rheumatic fever is only involving this mitral stenosis but the most common one you see the first line of valvular heart disease the most common one is actually you know the cause which is caused by rheumatic fever is this mitral stenosis so mitral stenosis is extremely uncommon in us because of very low incidence of acute rheumatic fever because acute rheumatic fever incidence is low in us that's why you're not going to see ms cases too much ms cases there Critical narrowing is defined as valve surface area because this is the stenosis. This is narrowing of the valve, especially mitral valve. Mitral valve is in between left atria and the left ventricle. So there is critical narrowing is defined as valve surface area less than 1 cm square. Remember these words are very important for exam point of view. Less than 1 cm square. So if, it's the, if the area is less than 1 cm square, then you will say this is critical narrowing. Or if it's critical narrowing, however, the main indication for treatment is the presence of symptoms. If the patient is asymptomatic, no need of any treatment. There is no need of treatment if the patient is asymptomatic. You are only providing treatment if the patient is symptomatic and he's having you know diameter or valve 
surface area that is less than one centimeter square that is considered to be a critical narrowing point however the main indication for the treatment is the presence of symptoms the patient must be having symptoms there is not much point in treating ms that is asymptomatic that is for sure we are not going to provide any treatment those who are actually asymptomatic now tip for us is look for pregnancy and immigrant in the history as a clue to answering what is the most likely diagnosis if in your history if in your scenario question scenario if there's a history of an immigrant or if there's if the if a patient is pregnant then you should always think of this disorder pregnancy is associated with a 50 percent increase in plasma volume which must traverse a narrow valve and in addition during delivery contraction of the uterus can squeeze you know during delivery 500 ml of extra blood is actually you know uh, no, is actually expel, expelled or is actually propelled into the central circulation and thereby inducing pregnancy related cardiomyopathy so this pregnancy related cardiomyopathy is highly associated with this mitral stenosis because why because during delivery during contraction of the uterus 500 of ml of blood is actually propelled into the central circulation and thereby the patient is experiencing hypertension and that is because of pregnancy related hypertension pregnancy related cardiomyopathy Apathy. So most patients with mitral stenosis are immigrant to the US coming from geographic regions in which acute rheumatic fever is, is still common right so two two points to be remembered especially in the pregnant patient right there you are going to see actually that because of the increase of plasma volume there will be you know uh, there will be much more aggravation of this uh, mitral stenosis and especially immigrants so because in us we are having very low low cases but those who are immigrant those who are coming from geographic region where the acute rheumatic fever is common thereby they are getting actually more of this infection that is mitral stenosis because one of the most common cause of acute rheumatic fever is mitral stenosis so mitral stenosis often present in young adult patients you are going to see them mostly in young and adult patients see this stenosis area less than one centimeter square then this should be a mitral stenosis the slit like see the slit like the whole area is narrowed now presentation besides the usual shortness of breath and remember only symptomatic mitral stenosis you are going to treat there is no point of treating asymptomatic patients only treat symptomatic patients so what are the symptoms beside the usual shortness of breath and congestive heart failure associated with all forms of irregular heart disease mitral stenosis has a number of relatively unique features of presentation say for example your patient is presenting with dysphagia difficulty in swallowing why he is having difficulty in swallowing the answer is very simple see because of this you know you are see the left from left atrium la pressing on the esophagus just you know uh, this left atria behind this you are having your patient's esophagus so if there is hypertrophy of the left atrium then what will happen this left atria is going to compress the esophagus and the patient is going to experience dysphagia because of that then we have hoarseness why this hoarseness because this left atria is actually pressing on laryngeal nerve so whenever there is pressing of laryngeal nerve you are going to see hoarseness so dysphagia hoarseness these are the symptoms then we have atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation in stroke from enormous left atrial hypertrophy right so if they because of the enormous left atrial involvement we can see stroke we can see atrial fibrillation so the, again this is the presentation then hemoptysis blood and sputum so these are the symptoms if your patient is experiencing any of these symptoms it means he's a symptomatic one and if he's a symptomatic one you should treat your patient see this left atria is pressing against this esophagus thereby thereby the patient is having dysphagia and laryngeal nerve is also going somewhere nearby and that's why the hoarseness will be there all right now we're coming towards physical finding so murmur murmur is in diastole this is very important at which particular point you are going to hear a murmur so especially if you are considering mitral stenosis then mitral stenosis murmur it is extra cardiac heart sound you are going to hear which is in diastole diastole means when heart relaxes when heart is actually getting its own blood just after an opening snap see just after an opening snap when the heart is in relax 
relaxing condition at that particular moment you're going to hold a murmur squatting and leg raising increase the intensity from increased venous return to the heart that is very simple you know when the patient do squat and leg raising then what will happen it will increase the venous return and if the venous return is increased thereby you are going to hurt this loud murmur you remember venous return venous return is increasing and especially venous return is also increasing when during inhalation thereby you are going to hear left side murmurs more right and this is a left side murmur mitral one now diagnostic test so we can do echocardiography and you remember which type of echo echocardiography is considered to be the best initial one we have transthoracic and we have transesophageal no doubt transesophageal is better and more accurate but we routinely actually do for do this transthoracic one so transthoracic is the best initial test right transthoracic echocardiography although we know very well that transesophageal echocardiography is more accurate but however catheterization is the most accurate diagnostic test so best initial will be transthoracic echo and most accurate diagnostic test will be a catheterization this is same for all valve diseases just not for the mitral stenosis it is actually same for all the valvular heart diseases now what about ecg or ekg atrial rhythm disturbances you are going to see the rhythm disturbances atrial rhythm especially particularly we are talking about atrial fibrillation is very common left atrial hypertrophy shows up a biphasic p wave in leads v1 and v2 so because of the high pressure because of the stenosis of the mitral valve the atria is actually going to exert a large amount of pressure and because of the exerting of large amount of pressure at one point arrives there will be atrial hypertrophy of the left atria at that particular point when there is hypertrophy of left atria you are going to see biphasic p wave biphasic p wave in lead v1 and v2 so thereby you are going to see this is the ecg findings and especially because of left atrial hypertrophy you are going to see this biphasic wave and particularly sometime rhythm disturbance is also there and that is known as atrial fibrillation now what about the chest x ray what typical finding we are going to see on chest x rays and with chest x ray usually describe we only hypertrophy so if there we are having actually atrial hypertrophy and left atrial hypertrophy so what you are going to see on chest x ray there must be straightening of the left heart border there must be elevation of the left main stem bronchus because why is this left main stem bronchus elevated because of the hypertrophied left atria right why there is a straightening of the left heart border because of the hypertrophied left atria and second bubble behind the heart so if you are going to see on x-ray second bubble behind the heart that is very suggestive of left ventricular or oh sorry left atrial hypertrophy so this bubble behind the heart especially and this elevation of the left main stem bronchus the straightening of the left heart border these are actually all the chest x-ray findings for mitral stenotic patient see in large left atrium pushes up left main stem bronchus like this and that's why that's why you know what's doing it's it's actually elevating the left main stem bronchus and that you're going easily uh, you know that you're going to see easily on chest x-ray now treatment what type of treatment you are going to give in the case of mitral stenosis diuretics and sodium restriction when fluid overload is present in the lung so if the pathology pathophysiology is all because of fluid overload then what you are going to do you are going to uh, advise this diuretics and sodium restriction in order to get rid of excess extra fluid then we have in case of especially mitral stenosis we actually performing this balloon valvuloplasty we know very well that we the surgical interventions are most important because medication alone are not enough especially those who are having symptoms so most likely we can do this balloon valvuloplasty balloon valvuloplasty done with a catheter and we can always go for this valve replacement only when a catheter procedure cannot be done or fails so if catheter procedure cannot be done or if it's failed then only you can go and proceed to this valve replacement only we have warfarin for atrial fibrillation that is a complication to an inr of 2 to 3 and mitral stenosis and uh, and metal heart valves are the two remaining indication for the use of warfarin so you should know in which conditions we can use warfarin we know very well that warfarin is actually when when we are using warfarin when the patient is experiencing atrial fibrillation and we know very well those who are having mitral stenosis they are having a high chance of getting this atrial fibrillation they are having rhythm disturbance rhythm disorder that is most common as atrial fibrillation so in order to maintain their inr in between 2 to 3 we usually start with this warfarin 
and mitral stenosis the one who is having mitral stenosis the one who is having metal heart valve inside these are the two remaining indications for the use of warfarin it's not so we can easily say that warfarin can be used in three conditions so what are the three conditions in which you can use warfarin first one whenever there is atrial fibrillation second one in the case of mitral stenosis and third one the when, when, when the patient is having yeah replacement of already replaced replaced heart valve is inside metal heart valve is inside so if it's already if the if the patient is already having uh you know this metal heart valve inside or if the patient is having mitral stenosis or if the patient is having atrial fibrillation so these three are actually the main indications for the use of warfarin in order to maintain our INR patient's INR in between two to three now all others with atrial fibrillation and cat's west curve that is more than two get a NOAC that is non-oral vitamin k anticoagulant so we have this non-oral vitamin k anticoagulant uh, nowadays these are new drug therapies and we are actually providing this NOAC medication to those who are having atrial fibrillation and we actually uh, calculate a criteria for this CHATS West, Co West scoring system so on the basis of this CHATS West score if it's score if it's more than two and if the patient is having atrial fibrillation we can always prescribe this NOAC that is non vitamin K oral anticoagulant medication we can also prescribe so just keep this in your mind that we nowadays we are using NOAC in order to uh, once we are calculator once we are done with this chat by scoring calculation and once we are done with that we are very sure that the patient is having atrial fibrillation so if the patient is having both of these two like the score is more than two and the patient is having atrial fibrillation it's far better to use NOAC medication in those patients now what about the rate control rate control of atrial fibrillation we are going to control rate with the help of digoxin you can advise beta blocker or calcium channel blocker but remember which calcium channel blocker we are we are usually preferring in the two that is diltiazem and verapamil so, diltiazem and verapamil we are actually using for rate control we are using beta blocker for the rate control and we are using digoxin for rate control especially in case of atrial fibrillation so just remember so the treatment the whole treatment is actually uh, is uh, dependent upon the causes if the cause is fluid overload just give him diuretic just give just advise him sodium restriction yeah do sodium restriction in that patient do balloon valvular plasty done with catheter you can always you know replace the valve if replace the valve right when catheter procedure cannot be done or if it's failed then you can only use this valve replacement you can always prescribe warfarin when there is complication and three things should be in your mind when the patient is having atrial fibrillation if ms is there if if any metal uh, already ha heart valve replacement is there only in that case you're going to give warfarin right but nowadays those who are having chat vest score of more than two those who are having atrial fibrillation we can give them far more better than warfarin and that is no non-oral vitamin a anticoagulant medication then we have rate control uh, rate uh, control rate controller we have rate control of atrial fibrillation with digoxin and beta blocker so we can always control the rate with the help of digoxin with the help of beta blocker with the help of calcium channel blocker that is diltiazem and verapamil now we are coming towards next category and that is aortic stenosis all right so aortic stenosis the word indicate aorta aortic valve where are these aortic valve in between the pulmonary now in between the aorta and left ventricle so in between the left ventricle and aorta we are having this aortic valve just one minute yes so in between the left ventricle and aorta we are having this aortic valve yes just one second okay all right so aortic stenosis can be caused by congenital bicuspid valve see congenital bicuspid valve so aortic valve are actually tricuspid they have tricusp right but by chance if like if anatomically if there is bicusp instead of tricusp and in, in case of three cusp if there is two cusp congenitally then you can see this aortic stenosis and with the age 
age advancement because they are mostly associated with increasing calcification as people age so there you can see right that this is actually showing the aortic stenosis so this is stenosis and if it's bicuspid it, it like if two cuspid there like this if this bicuspid so this this uh, could be considered as an anatomic variation anatomic problem this is a congenital problem and valvular heart diseases usually are congenital so presentation what what how your patient is going to present first of all angina ischemic heart disease pain most common presentation syncope most of the time when patient is complaining of syncope syncope you remember loss of consciousness loss of consciousness sudden loss of consciousness with sudden regain so if the patient lost his consciousness suddenly and regained his consciousness suddenly then always think about this valvular heart diseases or cardio maybe cardiac reason so syncope is the most important presentation in the case of aortic stenosis and then or maybe congestive heart failure poorest prognosis with two year age every survivor if the patient is having congestive heart failure and he is developing aortic stenosis then you know the poorest prognosis is there and most of the time with two year average survival so only two year average survival is there if the patient is having congestive heart failure and he is having aortic stenosis too now we are coming towards murmur which type of murmur you are going to heard in case of aortic stenosis so now in case of systole during systole during contraction if you are going to heard a crescendo decrescendo murmur first loud and then slow up and down slope a stroke if it's there in uh, towards you know uh, the sound and during contraction that speaking in a diamond shape in a mid systole during mid systole during mid of the contraction if you're going to hear a murmur which is very loud and then slows down it's a murmur of aortic stenosis the murmur of aortic stenosis is heard best at the right second intercostal space right second intercostal space if you put your stack you're going to hear a murmur and actually it's going to radiate towards the carotid artery so radiation is very important very important see second right intercostal space you're going to hear a murmur but actually where it's radiating it's radiating towards the carotid artery so if the question asks you which murmur is going to radiate towards the carotid artery you should remember that this is a murmur of aortic stenosis and this murmur is actually a systolic murmur this is actually a crescendo decrescendo murmur now while cell one standing improve or decrease in intensity of murmur from decreased venous return to the heart see <coughs> what if we what uh, sorry what can we do if we can just decrease the venous return to the heart and how we are going to decrease the venous return we can ask patient to do well self maneuver right we can ask a patient to especially you know from sitting to standing position so standing most of the time and well self these are the two maneuvers which can help or decrease the intensity of the murmur and how they are going to decrease the intensity of the murmur from decreased venous return to the heart when we are standing on a posture venous return is decreased towards the heart when we are doing valve salva venous return is decreased towards the heart and when venous return is decreased towards the heart there will be low pressure on the heart and because of the low pressure you are going to hear that this murmur will become softer so hand grip hand grip softens the murmur why because of decreased ejection of blood when you just hand grip the patient you actually you know you're going to grip your patient's hand then what will happen if you're just going to grip your patient's hand then it will definitely soften the murmur of aortic stenosis why why it's going to soften the murmur because of decreased ejection of blood blood ejection blood ejection will be decreased when you just grip the patient's hand what will happen there will be a decreased ejection of the blood and if there is decreased ejection of the blood definitely you're going to heard a soft murmur you're not going to heard a loud murmur so valve salva hand gripping and standing you just need to remember these three things valve salva standing and hand grip these are actually maneuvers are just like medicine right you are prescribing medicine or if you are asking or prescribing a good maneuver to your patient is just maneuver just acting like a drug so it's good to you know advise patient to do these maneuvers like valve salva maneuver if your patient is having aortic stenosis because by doing valve salva maneuver actually what are you doing you are actually doing the decreased venous return to the heart and thereby decreasing the murmur of the aortic stenosis
right so well salva standing and hand gripping these are the three maneuvers by which the patient's murmur can be decreased especially which murmur this uh, crescendo decrescendo systolic murmur this is a murmur of aortic stenosis which actually are going to hold on right second into costal space but it's radiating towards the carotid artery now what are the diagnostic tests similar same testing you are going to do initial one ecg but the best initial echocardiography you have transthoracic you have transesophageal transesophageal is more accurate but we usually do in our routine practices and that is transthoracic echocardiography ekg ekg left ventricular hypertrophy you are going to see you are going to see left ventricular hypertrophy and s wave in v1 plus r wave in v5 if it's greater than 35 mm that is a clue for you that is a clue for you that this is left ventricular hypertrophy this is how we are going to calculate with the help of ecg we are what we will do what we just calculate the number of square boxes and by doing this like you calculate s wave in v1 right in v1 you calculate the number of boxes of s wave and you are going to calculate number of boxes of r wave in v5 so number of boxes of v1 one s wave in v1 and number of boxes of r wave in v5 when you add together it should be like seven boxes or seven five or 35 so it should be more than 35 millimeters then you can say oh this is a left ventricular hypertrophy now chest x-ray left ventricular hypertrophy definitely on chest x-ray you're going to see left ventricular hypertrophy left ventricular hypertrophy in mitral stenosis you are seeing right uh, left atrial hypertrophy and especially in aortic stenosis you're going to see left ventricular hypertrophy because aorta is a stenosis very less amount of blood is going out from the heart and that's why left ventricle needs to do more work and because of doing more work the left ventricle becomes hyper Hypertrophied. That's why you're going to see left ventricular hypertrophy in, the, in these patients. Now, transcatheter replacement is very effective for aortic stenosis. Most of the time, for mitral stenosis, for aortic stenosis, we always prefer replacement therapies because medication alone are not effective. We should do some surgical intervention, especially in the case of stenosis, whether it's an aortic stenosis or it's a mitral stenosis. So here, transcatheter replacement is very effective for aortic stenosis see this is showing the hypertrophy left ventricular hypertrophy heart size is more than 50 percent of transthoracic diameter so this is cardiomegaly that is cardiac enlargement now treatment how you are going to treat your patient well replacement is the only truly effective therapy for aortic stenosis advancing age right so well replacement is the must well replacement is the only truly effective therapy for aortic stenosis diuretic can be used to decrease congestive heart failure yes you can decrease the overload by using these diuretic if the patient is presenting with congestive heart failure but you know very well if the patient is having aortic stenosis and he's having congestive heart failure the poorest prognosis will be there only the survival rate of the patient is less than two years so you can always prescribe diuretic if you're seeing a patient is having congestive heart failure but patient do not tolerate volume depletion very well this is the main point these patients because of the age they do not tolerate volume depletion very well we have balloon valvuloplasty that is not routinely done for AS and this is because the main mechanism for developing AS is calcification. So what is the point of you know doing valvuloplasty if it's already calcified, the valvule already calcified, the only thing you can do is surgical removal which does not improve very well with balloon valvuloplasty. Balloon or catheter producers are done only, sorry procedures. If you're doing balloon procedure or catheter procedure, that is only for if surgery is not an option or secondary to instability or fragility of the patient. But in calcification, most of the time, there is, uh, there is only one chance that we can surgically remove it. There is no point of ballooning or doing catheter or catheterized position, uh, means catheter procedure. Uh, if uh, you can do actually you can do ballooning and catheterization but only if surgery is not an option or secondary to the instability or fragility of the patient and only in these two conditions you can offer but it is always better if the patient is a case of aortic stenosis go straight for surgical replacement then transcatheter aortic valve replacement this is a replacement right and this is transcatheter aortic valve replacement is an acceptable alternative to surgical valve replacement means total replacement if you want if you can't do total replacement you can do only this transcatheter aortic valve replacement and that is this is considered to be an acceptable alternative to surgical valve replacement 
in especially in the case of aortic stenosis so this trans catheter aortic valve replacement is different from a balloon dilatation because balloon dilatation of as is inferior to valve replacement valve replacement is always superior one but if you can't do valve replacement if you can't do ballooning then in the middle of these two like ballooning and valve replacement you have another option and that in the middle we have this trans catheter aortic valve replacement you can say first option is ballooning second one is trans catheter aortic valve replacement and third one is surgical valve replacement we usually don't perform ballooning because uh, because of the um, calcification so we have two things in our hand either we can go for this uh, trans catheter aortic valve replacement or we can go for so uh, total replacement like valve replacement so this TAVR that is trans catheter aortic valve replacement is a valve replacement and it's simply a valve replacement is deployed through a catheter. You just deployed it, this to deploy this replacement with the help of catheter and TAVR is not an option for regurgitated and lesions. It's only for stenosis and aortic stenosis lesion. This TAVR has a slightly lower risk of death compared with surgery and possible questions comparing the two therapies include. So whenever whenever there is a you know therapy uh, comparison or whenever they are asking for the lower risk of the death. So of course definitely with the use of this trans catheter aortic valve replacement the chances of mortality and morbidity is low as compared to direct surgical valve replacement. So TAVR has slightly low lower risk of death compared with surgery and possible questions comparing the two therapies include which has higher risk of acute kidney injury and atrial fibrillation so of course when you're doing surgery when you are doing total valve replacement so those patients are more prone towards getting this acute kidney injury and those patients are more prone towards getting atrial fibrillation which has a higher risk of residual aortic regurgitation and need for pacemaker replace uh, pacemaker placement so which has a higher risk of residual ar and need for pacemaker replacement then we can always think of this TAVR so some you know uh, everything is associated everything has its own positive and negative point so higher risk of AKI and atrial fibrillation is associated with surgery higher risk of residual AR and need for pacemaker is, is usually associated with this trans catheter aortic trans catheter aortic valve replacement now we are coming towards mitral regurgitation so now mitral valve mitral valve is in between yes it's in between left atria and the left ventricle now this valve is regurgitating regurgitating means the backward flow of blood is there so if backward flow of blood is there then what will happen when the atria contract blood should enter into the left ventricle and when left ventricle contract the blood should enter into the aorta but if regurgitation is there then during ventricular contraction some of the blood will enter into the left atria when left ventricle contracts the blood will definitely go into the aorta but because of the mitral regurgitation some amount of blood will be going back into the left atria and as a result can cause increased left atrial pressure and left atrial hypertrophy and all that so mitral regurgitation is an abnormal backward flow of blood through a mitral valve that does not fit together so you're going to see hypertension or endocarditis and myocardial infarction with papillary muscle rupture or any other reason that the heart dilates will lead to mr whatever the reason whatever the reason maybe you know there is hypertension there is endocarditis there is myocardial infarction there is weakening of the valve weakening of the walls like papillary muscle rupture all of these things can lead to mitral regurgitation just just make a note of it any other reason that the heart dilate will lead to mr so dilatation can lead to mitral regurgitation Trans catheter aortic valve replacement is not a balloon dilatation. That is some that is different. It's by a catheter. That's only a point upon the here. Just back towards topic that mitral regurgitation. Actually, the causes of mitral regurgitation are very specific. Like during hypertensive period, hypertension. Hypertension is the main cause of mitral regurgitation. Endocarditis is the main cause of regurgitation. Myocardial infarction, papillary muscle rupture. These are all the causes of mitral regurgitation. And whenever there is mitral regurgitation, the heart will, you know, because of dilatation of the heart, it can lead to mitral regurgitation. So first dilatation and then regurgitation. 
so mr present with the same sign and symptoms of congestive heart failure the only unique finding is the murmur on the basis of murmur you are going to differentiate here in the case of mitral regurgitation you are going to heard a murmur throughout systole throughout systole means that pan systolic pans mean all all throughout the systole or holo systolic throughout the systole obscuring both s1 and s2 you are not going to heard s1 you are not going to heard s2 instead of that the whole murmur is there that is known as pan systolic so if you are going to hear a pan systolic murmur definitely you are going to say this is a murmur of mr and remember the mr murmur is usually radiating towards axilla and you remember where are actually the murmur of aortic stenosis radiates yes aortic stenosis radiates towards carotid and murmur of mr radiating towards axilla so hand grip hand grip will worsen the murmur can you see hand grip will worsen it's not a case of aortic stenosis where hand grip actually you know soften the murmur here hand grip will worsen the murmur of mr by pushing more blood backward through the valve see already regurgitation is there and you're also grip your patient's hand then what will happen you are actually pushing more blood backward through the valve and thereby you are actually increasing the murmur right by pushing backward by pushing blood backward you are actually increasing the murmur intensity so hand grip actually worsen it so hand grip increases after load and will worsen the murmur of both aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation again the same thing hand grip what is actually hand grip doing hand grip is also increasing the after load and if the after load is increased with the help of this hand grip then definitely you are going to see that there will be worsening of the murmur of both it's also like aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation in both of these regurgitation because both of them are on the left side and because of the increasing after load you are actually increasing the uh, uh, increasing the workload on a uh, left side of the heart including the aorta including the mitral and that's why you're going to see uh, increased murmur so squatting and leg raising will also worsen because all of them go together right squatting and leg raising will also worsen mr by increasing venous return to the heart because actually they are increasing venous return to the heart and by increasing venous return you are actually putting more pressure towards the heart and there will be more regurgitation and thereby and thereby you're going to see more murmur more intensity of murmur all left sided murmur except mitral valve prolapse there is only an exception of the prolapse right there is only exception of the prolapse except mitral valve prolapse all left sided murmurs like have an hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy this is not hcm this is hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy hocm is different from hcm hocm is a congenital thickening of the interventricular septa more than four times if more than four times there is thickening of the interventricular septa then what will happen there is decreased left ventricular cavity size and because of the decreased left ventricular cavity size you are going to see what is happening most of the time those who are athletes who are doing heavy strenuous exercise already their left ventricular size is decreased because of the interventricular septal thickening congenitally and when they do heavy work they will suddenly you know uh, there will be suddenly ischemia infarction is happening and the patient can die because of myocardial infarction during that strenuous activity or heavy exercise so that is all because of hocm hocm that is hyper obstructive cardiomyopathy right so in whole valvular heart disease everything you know goes in one direction and this mvp and hocm will go in other direction together mvp and hocm will not follow the other same rules or the other same features right so all left sided murmur except mvp and hocm will increase with expiration this we did in right in the beginning as well right all the left sided murmur they will increase with expiration because why what is actually actually happening in expiration and actually in expiration there is a squeezing of the blood from the pulmonary pulmonary system from the lungs and from the lungs if there is squeezing of the blood then definitely veins are coming towards the heart and when coming towards the heart they will be you know they will be carrying more more pressure towards the heart and you are going to heard murmur that is going to be worst right so all left sided murmurs Uh, will actually increase with expiration but you're not going to see those increase with, uh, when there is a mitral valve prolapse i mean there is hocum hyperobstructive cardiomyopathy 
As with all murmurs, mitral regurgitation is diagnosed with echocardiography. Again, you have to do echocardiography in order to make the diagnosis. See, this is a very nice, very nice chart, uh, very nice actually diagram. There you can see that, say for example, this is mitral stenosis, right? So this is S1 and this is S2. Soon after, before the uh, after the opening is snap, or you can say during diastole. See, S2 is diastole, S1 is systole. So in diastole, soon after opening is snap, if you're going to hear a murmur, that will be a murmur of MS. The first we did, right? MS soon after an opening is snap or during diastole. So during diastole, soon after an opening is snap, if you're going to hear a murmur, that is a murmur of MS, right? If we are starting from the S1 and S2 and we are going to see a diamond shaped thing, right? Crescendo and then decrescendo. Crescendo is up a stroke and decrescendo is down a stroke and this is a this is a diamond shape. So and during in between systole and diastole, especially in between systole, right? So if it's a murmur, then you can say this is a murmur of aortic stenosis. So if during systole you're going to hear a crescendo decrescendo murmur, then this is known as a murmur of aortic stenosis. If during whole whole systole you're going to hear a murmur, see starting from S1, you won't be able to differentiate what is S1, you won't be able to differentiate what is S2. During whole systole, this is systole, during whole systole. If you're going to heard a murmur, then this is known as pan-systolic murmur. This is known as holosystolic murmur. And this is a murmur of MR. So from S1 to S2, this is systole. And again from S2 to S1, this is diastole. So MS, you're going to heard in a diastole just after an opening is snap. A AS, you're going to heard in a systole. But that is a crescendo-decrescendo murmur. And if you're going to heard a systolic murmur, but that is pen systolic that is holo systolic you're not able to hurt s1 and s2 and during whole contraction you're going to hurt a murmur then this is known as mitral regurgitation now look at here in case of aortic regurgitation it's not in the systole category it's in the diastole right this is s1 this is s2 and this is again s1 so in this between these two this is systole between these two this is diastole so if you're going to hurt a decrescendo see this is decrescendo this is plateau and then decrescendo so if you're going to hurt a murmur that is decrescendo type and in the diastole that is a murmur of aortic regurgitation similarly if you're going to hurt a that is the same same thing diamond shaped murmur crescendo decrescendo murmur during systole this is a murmur of hookum so aortic stenosis and hookum are having same murmur the same murmur that is crescendo decrescendo systolic murmur now mvp in the mid systole see this is the mid systole you can just see starting from here to there if you just you know take a half then this is mid one so if you are going to hear the mid systolic click so mid systolic click is of actually mitral valve prolapse so this is mid systole in the systole in between if you're going to hear a murmur and that is presenting in the form of click so mid systolic click is actually mvp murmur right so just revise one more time this is diastole diastolic murmur just after an opening is snap that's a murmur of ms systolic murmur which is a crescendo decrescendo one in between the systole this is known as a s murmur the pen systolic the holosystolic murmur during systole is a murmur of mr the crescendo decrescendo not crescendo decrescendo murmur if you're going to hurt in cyst in diastole that is a murmur of ar and again the same thing crescendo decrescendo murmur in systole that's a murmur of hookum and mid systolic click if you're going to hurt that is a murmur of mitral valve prolapse all right now we're coming towards treatment so actually what is the treatment treatment of this one treatment of mitral regurgitation all right now we're coming towards treatment of mitral regurgitation so mitral regurgitation is treated with vasodilators you are going to use acis angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors arbs are best no drug decreases the rate of progression of regurgitant lesion if you actually want to decrease the rate of progression there is no single drug by which you can just decrease the rate of progression you have to use this acis and arbs that are actually vasodilator but they are going to be very effective digoxin and diuretic may be used sometime as they would be in any form of congestive heart failure then like in the case of congestive heart failure you are using digoxin and diuretic same way same how same same uh, way you are going to use digoxin and diuretic here also 
valve replacement is indicated when the heart starts to dilate that's why you keep on checking the end systolic diameter right by which you are going to decide as soon as the heart dilates too much then you have to do some surgical intervention because once myocardium is stretches it will never come back to its original position do not wait for left ventricular end systolic diameter to become too large because the damage will be irreversible that's very important left ventricular and systolic diameter you need to measure time to time with the help of catheterization that's the most accurate one because if you don't do that then there will be irreversible damage and irreversible damage means that you are not going to get benefit when you just do this now when left ventricular end systolic diameter is above 40 mm or the ejection fraction drops below 60 now these are the two parameters first one is left ventricular end systolic diameter if it's going above 40 and if the ejection fraction is going down that is below 60 now these two are the parameters on on the basis of which you're going to decide yeah now it's a high time for surgical valve repair or replacement is indicated so valve repair means either you can do operatively or with a catheter placing a clip or sutures across the valve to tighten it up whatever the procedure you are opting you are doing it operatively you are doing it catheter placement you are, you are applying sutures you have to do it once the left ventricular end systolic diameter is reaching above 40 and systolic uh, and ejection fraction is dropping below 60 percent these two are the parameters on the basis of which you are going to decide that surgical intervention is now needed now we are coming towards aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation means aortic valve is in between the left ventricle and the aorta. So what will happen when the left ventricle contracts, the blood should enter into the aorta, right? But what happen if there is regurgitation, so aorta definitely will going to, you know, circulate, uh, push blood towards the whole arterial system. But if there is aortic regurgitation, then what happened there must be some backward flow of blood from aortic valve again from aorta into the left ventricle and thereby increasing the size of the left ventricle pressure of the left ventricle and there will be hypertrophy of the left ventricle all because of this aortic regurgitation so aortic regurgitation is caused by anything that makes the heart or aorta dilate in size so it may be because of myocardial infarction can do this aortic regurgitation hypertension can do endocarditis marfan syndrome in or cystic medial necrosis connective tissue disorder there you can see aortic regurgitation inflammatory disorders such as ankylosing spondylitis or Reiter syndrome in that case also you are going to see aortic regurgitation we are actually knowing the etiologies of or the causes of aortic regurgitation in the case of syphilis you are going to see aortic regurgitation so these are actually the causes and the cause in which you are going to see the heart is dilated and that is aortic because of aortic regurgitation so what is the main presentation how your patient is going to present beside congestive heart failure aortic regurgitation has a large array of relatively unique physical findings so you are going to see some unique physical findings no doubt your patient is also, also always going to present with the congestive heart failure symptoms right but aortic regurgitation has a large array of relatively some unique findings are also there by on the basis of which you can say oh this is a case of aortic regurgitation now, only the point to ponder here this box is only the point to ponder right no drug delays the progression of ar or mr no one is going to stop the progression or delay the progression once it started it will definitely go on you just need to cure symptomatically so white pulse pressure now there are the findings on the basis of which you can definitely say this is a case of ar so if you're going to see white pulse pressure if you're going to see water hammer pulse that is a wide and bounding pulse of course there is too much pressure inside the aorta and if aorta regurgitation aortic regurgitation occurs definitely you're going to see these findings like water hammer pulse like quinky's pulse pulsation in the nail bed hill sign bp in leg as much as 40 mmg above arm bp head bobbing that is demasic sign so it's just a clue for you if you're if you're seeing too much signs in a scenario you can think of this aortic regurgitation because too many signs are associated with this like water hammer like white pulse like quinkies pulse like health sign like head bobbing demoset sign all signs are associated with the aortic regurgitation the simple thing is this aorta is having so much pressure that it has to come to all parts of the bodies right 
so when it regurgitates definitely you're going to see all these signs now what type of murmur he is having aortic regurgitation gives a diastolic decrescendo murmur can you see here a diastolic murmur aortic regurgitation see this is systole this is diastole and this is decrescendo this is crescendo and then decrescendo but this is the decrescendo so this is diastole and this is decrescendo this is the murmur of ar so murmur AR gives a diastolic decrescendo murmur heard best over the left lower sternal border. Left lower sternal border on the left side, you're going to hear a murmur. Well, salva and standing make it better. Hand grip, which increases after load by compressing the arteries of the arms, make it worse. So, by doing well, salva and by standing, you know that is going to make it better. That is make it that is going to make it better but hand gripping hand gripping when we are doing then what will happen there actually increases the afterload afterload increases by compressing the arteries of the arms so if the arteries of the arms are compressed the afterload is increased then you're going to see there will be much more murmur so make it worse but by doing valsalva by doing because in valsalva there's in the increased venous return in standing Sorry, in Valsalva, there is decreased venous return. In standing, there is decreased venous return. In that condition, you are going to hurt. That is, the, the murmur will be soft. Now, diagnostic test. Same as previous diagnostic test mentioned, ECG and chest X-ray may show left ventricular hypertrophy. Of course, when aorta regurgitates, then too much amount of blood will remain in or will coming towards the left ventricle and thereby left ventricle can become hypertrophied. So treatment, ACIs and ARBs or nifedipine as vasodilator increase forward flow of blood because we want forward flow of blood. That's why we are introducing these vasodilators and they do not delay progression. There is no single drug that can delay the progression. You can just only treat it symptomatically. Digoxin and diuretic have a little benefit. Surgical valve replacement is used when there is acute valve rupture such as if you are seeing in a case with a myocardial infarction. Replace or repair the valve before the left ventricle dilate Excessively. So, you need to monitor the left ventricular and systolic diameter. While ejection fraction is still greater than 55% and left ventricular and systolic diameter less than 55, these are the two parameters. It should not be more than 40 and ejection fraction if below drops below 60, that is the indication for replacement. So, for heart replacement, valve replacement, repairing the valve means tightening the ends of the valve with sutures and this decreases regurgitation without the need for anticoagulation. So, repairing the valve means tightening the ends of the valve with sutures and if you're doing this, then there will be, this decreases regurgitation without and here also, of course, if you're doing like this, like suturing, there will be no need for anticoagulation in that case. Now we are coming towards bicuspid aortic valve. See bicuspid aorta is bicusp. Normally aorta is tricusp having three cusps. But if congenitally there is bicusp, we can say this is bicuspid aortic valve. So 1 to 2% of population normal aorta has three cusps. Most are asymptomatic. Aortic stenosis is most common complication. If the patient is having bicuspid aortic valve, most of the time he is presenting with aortic stenosis. Leads to aortic regurgitation with dilatation of the aortic descending aorta if there is a you know aortic regurgitation because of bicuspid aortic valve we are going to see dilatation of the aortic root and dilatation of the ascending aorta does not need endocarditis prophylaxis this is a congenital one there is no need for endocarditis prophylaxis if asymptomatic under age 30 monitor with echo every one to two years if the patient is asymptomatic don't worry about it but just keep on doing echocardiography every after one to two years no treatment proven to delay progression you just need to treat hypertension and just do symptomatic treatment if LV dysfunction and symptoms are there in your patient then definitely you are going to offer surgical replacement to your patient if LV dysfunction and the patient is symptomatic ask your patient for surgical replacement now we are coming towards mitral valve prolapse MVP and hookum go together Mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse is so common as to be considered a normal anatomic variant occurring as much as 25, oh sorry, as much as 2 to 5% of the population, particularly in women. Other causes are Marfan and Ahler Danlos syndrome, the connective tissue disorder, because there is a prolapse, cordotandini prolapsed, right? 
Quadrant antennae are the one that's at the pillar of valve. They usually keep the valve in their proper position. Now, what is the presentation? MVP is most often asymptomatic. You're not going to see any symptoms in your patient. But when symptoms do occur, it is different from the other forms of alveolar heart disease and you can easily catch up them. The symptoms of congestive heart failure are usually absent. The most common presentation, you're not going to see the symptoms of congestive heart failure in MVP. When most of the valvular heart disease, the patient is having just a symptom of CHF. But in the case of MVP, you're not going to see the symptoms of CHF like orthopnea, like S3 gallop, like dyspnea, shortness of breath, right? You're not going to see these features. The most common presentation rather in your patient will be a typical chest pain. There is palpitation, there is panic attack. If you have seen these conditions in your patient, like patient is having atypical chest pain, the patient is having palpitation, the patient is having panic attacks, think of this mitral valve prolapse. Now, murmur. Mitral valve prolapse present with mid-systolic leg. Remember that diagram, mid-systolic leg? See, this is the systole starting from here to there and this is the mid portion and this is a click known as mid-systolic click. So MVP is actually having a where it is yeah MVP present with mid systolic click that when severe is associated with a murmur just after the click for from mitral regurgitation auscultatory maneuvers have the opposite effect from the manu from the murmur of the valvular dis disease described so far so MVP present with mid systolic click that we have seen. Uh, that when severe is associated with murmur just after the click from mitral regurgitation so if there is mitral regurgitation so just after the click from mitral regurgitation you're going to heard a murmur and auscultatory maneuvers have the opposite effect from the murmur of the valvular disease described so far so that's why hookum and mvp go together a rest of the other you know things are different you're going to hear different murmurs and, and maneuvers will be you know will actually act differently on different heart diseases different valvular diseases but it will act differently in the case of mvp and hyperobstructive cardiomyopathy so like in the case of valsalva and standing valsalva and standing which decreases venous return to the heart see by doing well selva, actually the venous return is decreased. By standing, actually the venous return is decreased. In other cases, by doing well selva and standing, the murmur is getting better. But in the case of MVP, it's the opposite one. By doing well selva and by doing standing, it decreases venous return, but worsen MVP. So anything that increases left ventricular chamber size, because here, the, actually the main thing is this, that left ventricle size is actually compromised, like mitral valve prolapse. So you're going to see the changes in the left ventricular chamber size. So anything that increases left ventricular chamber size, such as squatting or hand grip, will improve or diminish the murmur because actually there is, there is the less chamber size. So if you're just going to increase the chamber size, definitely you're going to see there will be low murmur there will be a softening of the murmur because there will be more space there will be no turbulence of the blood if the space is narrow thereby only you're not creating a loud murmur but when you are actually increasing the left ventricular chamber size by doing squatting or by hand gripping that is actually help your patient to improve or diminish the murmur of mvp right this is all because of the cavity size now, diagnostic test. Echocardiography is the best choice. Catheterization should rarely, if ever, be done. This is largely because an exact pressure gradient does not need to be determined since well replacement is rarely needed. So, only the echocardiography is the best choice. We do catheterization, but in rare cases, we actually don't do catheterization. Although, in other valvular heart diseases, catheterization is the most accurate one. But in MVP, we usually don't do this. This is largely because an exact pressure gradient does not need to be determined since valve replacement is really needed in this patient now how you're going to treat your patient how you're going to treat your patient beta blockers beta blockers are used when the patient is symptomatic when your patient is symptomatic use beta blocker valve repair can be performed with a catheter by placing a clip to tighten up the valve a few stitches into the valve can markedly tighten up the leaflet, but surgical repair of the valve is really necessary. We don't do surgical repair. We actually, you know, a few stitches to the valve can markedly tighten up the leaflet. 
Endocarditis prophylaxis is not recommended even if the presence of a murmur of mitral regurgitation if you're going to hold a murmur of MR also in these patients but don't give endocarditis prophylaxis you remember in whom we are actually giving endocarditis prophylaxis those who are having the his previous history of endocarditis and those who have metal valve inside like already the placement is there in their body only in these those patients actually are giving endocarditis prophylaxis all right so i'm just going to stop here so tomorrow inshallah we are going to continue with cardiomyopathy just have a look on this valvular heart diseases i know it's a it's a bit um uh, time consuming topic because you need to memorize more thing you need to memorize murmur and all that in previous mtb and in kaplan handouts um there are good charts the comparison charts you know in between we are actually going to see those charts here also maybe uh not really those charts are there so you can you know uh, just have a look on that uh, they are there like in the case of these one they are here yeah okay we are going to see this maneuvers later maybe tomorrow inshallah but just have a you know look uh, and uh, try to uh, you know cover this topic again so tomorrow you'll you know definitely going to get a uh, benefit of this uh, revising the whole murmur and maneuvers because uh, tomorrow we are going to cover maneuvers and we'll see and we'll summarize the whole murmurs so it will definitely going to help you just have a second just have a read of this whole uh, webinar heart disease today itself Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye.